Welcome to the Let's Talk Crypto podcast, where we discuss the latest Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital asset news. Hi, everybody. Hope you're all well. Today's episode covers the new Facebook coin called Libra. We recorded this episode on Wednesday, the 19th of June. It was very interesting to hear our initial reactions and thoughts on the white paper. Key points that we cover are differences between it and Bitcoin, whether it is actually really a blockchain, how we think the regulators are going to respond to it, and what type of adoption we can expect to see. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a like, share it, or leave a comment below. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and push the little bell button so you receive notifications for future episodes. And if you're listening to it on iTunes, please give us a rating. With that said, let's get going. Hey everybody, welcome back to Let's Talk Crypto. Today we're going to be talking about Facebook's Libra coin and we joined with Omar. Hello. Slava. Hi everyone. And Suyash. Hi everyone. So the cat's out the bag. Facebook has finally released the white paper and put up a nifty little website for Libra coin. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I heard somebody the other day saying Libra coin, but it's, it's Libra coin. I think it's got some sort of play on words with freedom. What are, you, what are your guys' initial thoughts? I mean, everybody's been waiting so long to see the, the inner workings of this thing. And they've put up what appears to me to be a pretty generic sort of conglomerate of just buzzwords and you know anything that sort of can sort of pique people's attention throwing the word blockchain in here everywhere and there yeah i mean what what do you guys think slava what's your initial thoughts well we are certainly yet to know all the specifics and all the details about the project and best just like you mentioned facebook has done a great job outlining a general vision both for the organizational parts of the project as well as technological aspects of the project. But I think given that Facebook is one of the largest uh, tech companies in the world, and the fact that they decided to crack that case and make the currency more increased adoption rate for their specific cryptocurrency, that could play a very positive and constructive role for the whole industry in, uh, in general. So it is a very interesting project. And just before we started the recording, you mentioned that there are some already some developments that are happening right after the project has been released. So as I mentioned, there are several things which are very enticing about the project. So let's start by looking at what is the aim of a Libra project, Libra blockchain and Libra cryptocurrency, coincidentally. The, the problem that the project aims to accomplish is basically providing those who do not have, who are basically unbanked or underbanked population, provide them with ability to have financial services at fair market prices. What happens right now in a lot of places in the world is that those who have less financial resources have to typically pay a much higher a premium on financial service, uh, financial services. For example, one of the examples is remittances. So if I have to send money somewhere, let's say using Western Union or a MoneyGram or similar service, I would have to pay an obnoxious percentage to those organizations to transfer funds from one place to another. At the same time, uh, these currently, we all agree that blockchain is still in early stages and uh, there's a lot of development that's happening with cryptocurrency in the cryptocurrency industry. But we cannot deny the fact that volatility of cryptocurrencies, sometimes 500 to even more, uh, like in thousand dollars for Bitcoin per day or even in hours, it kind of limits the ability for us and users to use Bitcoin as well as other cryptocurrencies as a method of payment. Because I'm not sure I would like to spend my Bitcoin today because it can go in price by, I don't know, 1000% in the next few months. 
And so basically there are two problems that Libra is trying to solve. The first one is helping the unbanked population to become banked and allow them to pay their rates for financial services. At the same time, creating a cryptocurrency that will be stable. We can talk a little bit later about how they're going to make that happen. And kind of merging these two solutions together, this is in a sense, in a nutshell, a Libra, Libra project. Okay. Omar, what are your initial thoughts on the project? I think that it's, um, I went through, yesterday I went through the website because I was asked to prepare a guide on for the project. And then, of course, the guide so that we can publish the guide and b- basically give a recap of what, try to explain to everyone what it is and kind of what Slavo just, Slavo just said is, it's supposed to be used as a medium of exchange, more of more so a medium of exchange and uh, less focus on being a store of value and also a lot more focus on price stability. So when you say price stability, meaning that if I'm going to, this is an actual example from the website that it says that if you want to buy some coffee, your morning coffee, let's say, right? If you want to buy that, it should you should have an idea of how much fairly, approximately, how much it's going to cost you. So if it's like te- uh, if it's ten libra coins, for example, for a cup of coffee, it should more or less be ten libra coins the next day. More or less into the future, it should be around the same. Whereas with Bitcoin, the example they gave, or other volatile cryptocurrencies, the problem is that their prices fluctuate so wildly that the consumer and the merchant never really know how much they're supposed to pay. Finalize. For, for item. Well, yeah, because yeah. I, I buy a shirt, right? I buy a shirt for $10. In the morning, it's $100. In the evening, it's $1. So it's like, it's just, it's just a, a bit wild. And then there, one of the main points of contention or co- controversy in this, in this project was, was that is it decentralized? Because de- when you say you're decentralized, a lot of times one person's version of decentralization is not a- the same as another person. So Peter Todd, two people, I just quickly, two people I want to highlight here. Peter Todd, he is at, quite active in the uh, on crypto Twitter and the crypto community, and he is uh, a uh, technical expert as well. He claims or he has argued that the Facebook project is not is not decentralized because we have so many centralized powerhouses like Visa, MasterCard, who have joined like this sort of association that is going to serve as sort of like the management of this project. So it there are questions about whether it's decentralized or not. And second person uh, is a the author of Bitcoin Standard. It's a best-selling book on Bitcoin. Saifuddin, Dr. Saifuddin Amos, and he had a thread on Twitter, a detailed thread, explaining why Facebook, why he actually liked Facebook cryptocurrency idea because he said it's a a complement. It could be a complement to Bitcoin. It's not going to make Bitcoin irrelevant. Rather, Bitcoin is going to become stronger and more popular and more accepted because of this project. So that's a big thing coming from some guy who is considered a Bitcoin maximalist, someone who doesn't believe in any other coin except for Bitcoin. So those are the main things that I just wanted to tell you guys. Sure. And your initial thoughts, uh, Suyash? Well, on mine, I think the the first thing that uh, that picked my attention was the fact that Libra, the project itself, is more about um, creating new opportunities, like what what Facebook is is pushing forward for responsible financial services innovation. So their mission is very clear. They want to be involved in the financial financial services uh, services sector and. Even if they have catered for things like smart contracts development and so on, they don't want to be another Ethereum. Far from it. They want to specialize in the financial sector. 
and um, everything that will come out of it, I believe, so that in the future will be targeted toward this specific sector. They have put a lot of emphasis on the fact that internet connectivity is now quite high. People even even people who don't have bank accounts, they do have smartphones, they do have um, internet connections. So what they are targeting is to reach these people, these sector of these sections of populations which are underserved in terms of financial services, and offer them what Libra and Libra Coin has to offer. So basically, the mission for me is is quite clear, and the way they have set up the system, set up the, the blockchain in terms of decentralization and consensus algorithms, it's perfectly clear that they they want to be involved in the financial services uh, sector. And I think sure. it's fair to add, um, I was talking to several of my American friends and I actually had to transfer some funds. So the first thing that my American friend told me is like, can you actually use, send me the money, where the money be a messenger, the Facebook's messenger? And I was very surprised to learn that actually in America, as far as I understand, people can, in fact, transfer U.S. dollars using simply Messenger within the Messenger app. And so I guess this is not the first, Libra Project would not be the first a segue for Facebook into uh, financial services. But at the same time, there's a number of challenges that they're going to have to face or already facing because they're trying to not only get into the financial industry in America, which is highly regulated as well as across the world, but also bring blockchain and cryptocurrency closer to consumers, which certainly would be a big challenge when it comes to dealing with regulations. Very interesting. I mean, my, my initial thoughts are when I look at it just from a sort of high-level perspective is that they seem to be more a payment network, a payment system than a new form of money. And I think they're just sort of trying to take some of the things they like about the, the crypto, some of the cryptocurrency projects and sticking it into their project, you know, a whole mix, mismatch or mix match of, of things. And, and calling it cryptocurrency. And if you look carefully at it, I mean, it's not a blockchain. There are no blocks. And itself, the, the actual coin, the Libra coin, is going to be representative of a basket of assets or, or currencies and securities. So, yeah, you know, it, it won't even have its own free-floating sort of price discovery. So for me, a bit disappointed from that perspective. I mean, not that I, I wanted Facebook to succeed or anything, but I thought that maybe they would have come up with a better sort of, you know, a better idea than this. And as a payment system, I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it's great to have like a different payment system to the legacy systems that we have now that connects everybody via their social media or via messages or WhatsApp and, you know, whatever it may be. But I just feel that the actual money itself that's being transacted across that is, is no better than the US dollar itself. So it's disappointing from that perspective that they, you know, calling it a cryptocurrency. And I see it more as a, and I hate to put it this way, but more of a direct sort of challenge to, to cryptocurrency, a challenge to Bitcoin, which in my mind won't succeed. But the value proposition of Bitcoin is is really, you know, the, the scarcity, the decentralized nature of it, the unconfiscatable, uncensorable sort of properties. And none of those, absolutely none of those from what I can see are included when you look in the white paper. All they are focused on from what I can see is fast, cheap payments, which for me is just another payment network. And obviously, bringing it to a wider a wider sort of net of people around the world. And for that, yes, I applaud them, but I almost feel it's disingenuous to sneak that in there, you know, to, to get people on their side. That's my initial thoughts on it. And from what I've seen online, you know, it's sort of you know, split down the middle of whether this is a good thing for Bitcoin or a bad thing. And I think that from the perspective of getting people exposed to digital money or digital forms of payment which don't include a piece of plastic like a credit card or a physical notes and things like that. I think it's a great uh, step forward. I think it will expose people to the term cryptocurrency even though it's not technically what we would define as a cryptocurrency. It will still expose a lot more people to it. I can imagine people like 
older generations who are sort of more traditional, and I'm not bashing them, I'm just saying, you know, the ones that haven't become accustomed or as easy to convince as the younger generations that have been dealing a lot with digital uh, media and digital assets and things like that. I can imagine them being more trustworthy of something that came out from a, a tangible company like this. And then be lowering their barrier of, of sort of acceptance towards other things like Bitcoin afterwards via this. So almost like a stepping stone. So from, from that perspective, I'm, I'm quite excited. And I'm happy to see this go forward. I'm happy that it's not just a rumor. I'm happy that there is something. For me, it's almost acknowledgement that, yes, cryptocurrencies are here, Bitcoin's here. And it's not like as if it's going unnoticed. Something is being done about it, and it's going to be challenged and is being challenged. It's very interesting, Lance. I, I, I think when we're talking about challenges, at the end of the day, Facebook is a for-profit organization, even though they had created a separate project, LibraCoin, but certainly Facebook spent you know, resources, corporate resources onto the project. And at the same time, if we look at the mission, the overarching mission that Facebook has, which is bringing people closer together, and another interesting factor to consider is that Mark was very good at disrupting existing systems with Facebook. You know, they, they, they bought Instagram, they bought WhatsApp. So he's very good at anticipating challenges kind of come from different angles and might cause a challenge for the business. Facebook is a network. Right, it's just like Uber. And you can use that network to deliver information, to deliver services, and just like a payment method. And so I guess we can assume it's fair to assume that the move to create Libra Foundation and Libra Blockchain and Libra Coin is one of the ways to make sure that Facebook, the core of the business, maintains independent, you know, leadership position, not only as a network of people, but also as a network of payments. So I guess that kind of ties in with what you're saying uh, as far as being disingenuous by bringing blockchain into the picture and at the same time having more or less centralized kind of management system put in place for that specific project. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm kind of relieved in a way. Like there's nothing here that, that screams to me that say Bitcoin or one of the other sort of open uh, blockchains are in trouble or threatened in any way. I mean, maybe we can talk a little bit later about some of the the, the DAP platforms. But in terms of money, I, I see absolutely no threat here. In fact, I actually see this as being a net positive thing in terms of bringing people into the 21st century, into the internet of money type of thing. I think that Bitcoin will benefit from this in the long term. You can imagine when when you see the Bitcoin, Libra coin chart, people are going to see the one is stable, doesn't do anything. Now the one's going up in value. It's it's going mm. it's going to educate a lot of people and and cause them to make comparisons that that haven't been made yet. And I think that is a net positive for Bitcoin. I've just mm -hmm. received word right now while we're recording this podcast. Libra Coin has just been added to Coin Market Cap. It's already there now, as of a few minutes ago. So there we go. You you're going to have Libra Coin on Coin Market Cap there with Bitcoin and everything now. <laughs> It, it still remains to be seen what value and what market cap they're going to have and, and, and whether they're going to be number one. But always bearing in mind that Bitcoin is limited to 21 million coins and that's it. Um, Libra coin can just keep inflating and inflating. The more people that, that buy into it, you know, the, the more tokens they're going to sell. But the value of the token or coin that they have is inherently designed not to fluctuate in value. I mean, that's it's a stable coin, right? So... Yeah, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how this all plays out. The only thing I'm a bit disappointed in is that it's not launching immediately. It's, it's, there's still some time and development that has to go into this before we can have it out there in the wild. And wow, it's going to be an interesting time too for, for bugs, for hacks and things like that. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, everybody's going to go, throw everything at this, you know, and okay. Bitcoin's been out there in the wild for 10 years and, you know, a massive honeypot. And look, it's still going. It's still chugging along with 99.999999% uptime, you know. I, I, I couldn't agree more with, with what you're saying. Kind of like adding to that, if Libra coin were to accept it as a legal tender to, for people to buy products and services, 
then making the next step, like the logical step would be accepting actually Bitcoin. And if that happens, the value uh, of all cryptocurrencies is just going to explode uh, because because the, the amount of utility that's going to be generated from that by official accepting Bitcoin as payment methods in many different countries uh, is just going to drive the value up. To the Mars. Yeah, I mean, if a merchant can accept LibraCoin, it's not a stretch of the imagination to think they're going to accept Bitcoin and maybe some other cryptocurrencies, you know, and sort of move along with the times, catch up, catch up to wherever, you know, the other industries that have already moved digital, like the hotel industry, gone digital, the taxi industry, gone digital, you know. So it's time for the payments and banking and financial industry to go truly digital. So, uh, yeah, you know, I think it's a net positive for, for crypto and especially for Bitcoin. Now, looking at the actual white paper itself, I mean, if, we, if I just pull out some of the bits that I think are interesting, you guys can do the same. I find it quite telling that they are highlighting that they are going to be attracting developers, first of all. They're open source. Now, I don't know what they mean by open source. Is it just that they're letting everybody read their their the technical uh, white paper or does it mean that people are actually going to be able to contribute changes to the to the actual network to the core protocol itself that remains to be seen they might just be very clever in the way they're presenting this for now and the fact that they're going to allow for apps and competing wallets to be developed that's what i pulled out of the, the white paper which immediately jumped out at me that tells me that you know, they're not only, they don't only want to try and compete with payment systems like Bitcoin, they also want to go after, or, or money like Bitcoin, they also want to go after the dApps and de decentralized applications and things like that, which, which is interesting because there's quite a few out now. I mean, there's Ethereum, you've got EOS, you've got Tron, you've got Tezos, a whole bunch of them competing for the, the dApp sort of platform uh, chain or blockchain. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Well, I think I think here before we talk about that, two things in my opinion, two two very important and healthy things have happened here. Even if this whatever happens to this Facebook project, whether it succeeds or fails, which I don't think it'll fail, it'll succeed to some extent, and even the founders or the creators of the project that are backing it at this point, they themselves I don't think know exactly what will come out of it. But it's got the conversation going, really, really, really pushed the conversation out there to potentially even billions of people because of that Facebook's customer base and it's about to do something. So before this, it's possible that people were not even seriously talking and analyzing what cryptocurrency is about. Decentralization has become a hot topic now because everybody's obviously talking about whether things are decentralized or not. What is crypto? What it, what it is, what it is not. Confiscatable money, uncensorable money, a deflationary assets, inflationary assets, kind of like what we just talked about right now. Like it's got us talking, it's got everybody else talking. And then the concept behind Bitcoin or any technology should never be this is the best thing ever and we can never improve on it. And any other project that comes along is not going to have any merit and it's not going to succeed. That's not a healthy way to think about innovate. You can't really innovate if you think that way. I think that it's like you guys said, and it's, it is definitely a net positive in my opinion also. Yeah, no, no, thanks. I agree with you there. And, you know, it's also going to expose people, like I was saying, to the other types of, you know, everybody is familiar with Bitcoin. The, the, the layperson now, I mean, I, I think there's very few people, I know they do exist, but few people who haven't at least heard Bitcoin or, or know that Bitcoin exists. They might not know, not know much about it at all, but if you go to the average man in the street, a lot of them will say, yeah, okay, they've, they've heard of Bitcoin. But most of them wouldn't have heard of decentralized applications, and a lot of them haven't heard of Ethereum or any of these other type of things and it seems that at the same time whilst they're launching a, a payment system of sort they are also going they've also opened the idea because it's in their white paper that they are going to have different applications on this blockchain or oh, it's not a blockchain on this system and payment system not just well, well, as a means wait a minute you, you say it's not a blockchain except 
the in if you obviously you've seen the website it, it repeatedly refers to their platform as as something that is partly at least part of the system it consists of a blockchain so when you say that it's not a blockchain that's again interesting because we've got debate going now about what well, is a blockchain this very, and what isn't well well, there's no debate on this. In, in, the, in the white paper, it says there is no concept of a block of transactions in the ledger history. If there's no block of transactions, there's no blockchain. So there's no actual blockchain data structure in the Libra protocol. The blocks are more of a snapshot of system state. Do you get what I'm saying? They keep calling yeah. it a blockchain, but then they actually specifically say there are no blocks. Do you think that's misleading, though? No, I don't think it's misleading, but I don't want to call it a blockchain if there's no blockchain. <laughs> Am I being too pedantic? Maybe, I don't know, but I think I'd rather just call it the Libra payment network, which has a, a construct or, you know, of confirmed snapshots of system state, you know, basically. There are no blocks, according to its white paper, but it does contradict itself in a few places. But if you really think about the way the way they are sort of outlining it, it's it's not a blockchain. It is certainly decentralized, and from how I understood reading the white paper, not having blocks allows to increase the throughput of transactions. And so right now, Visa and Mastercard can do something like forty-five thousand transactions per second, and as we know, Bitcoin and other blockchains have a much slower transaction throughput. And so I guess the way I see it from the technical perspective is like having a constant stream of data rather than Correct. packing data into blocks, which slows down by definition the transactions. There's also from a technical perspective, no need to open new blocks to get the rewards incentivized miners because the only way you're going to create or mint new Libra coins is by paying fiat. Just to add to that, Slava, you know, one of the, the main reasons you, you have a block, let's call it like a container, right? So there's a container and we fill it with transactions. Then that block is, is full or it's done for that, that particular time period. The main reason for doing it is for ordering, for time stamping purposes, okay? So in a network where it's permissionless, where anybody can join and mine and leave again and join and do, you know, and you don't know which actors are coming and going, that is required so the data can be authenticated, okay? You have a time stamping thing. However, with the Libra network, it's a permissioned system for now, right? Remains to be seen how they're going to transition it to a permissionless system, as they say. But for now, it's a permissioned system, which is way more efficient because you know who the actors are and they play by the rules, okay? So it means that the transaction history is less likely to be rewritten, which means you don't need those containers to contain the transactions to be time stamped. You see? Mm -hmm. Sorry, and to add to that, to, to the thing about block number and things like that, when I check the, the white paper, the technical white paper, when you want to push a transaction, okay, here's a list of inputs that you need to push. So firstly, you have a sender address. Secondly, you have a sender public key. And thirdly, you have what we call program, that is all the inputs that you want to push in the transaction and the kind of parameters and so on. That's primarily due to the smart feature. Fourth, you have the gas price. The fifth, you have maximum gas amount, that is the amount you want to spend for that specific transaction. These five things are quite standard that we, you, you might find in other blockchains like Ethereum or Bitcoin. But on the sixth input is called a sequence number. And I think Correct. that's it directly related to what you were referring was that yes. this is used to identify the transaction and it makes complete sense when you are not using a block structure like a traditional blockchain to use this sequence number uh, parameter. The point also is that a Libra, the Libra block, let's say the Libra blockchain use, uh, uses a lot of features that are available in other blockchains like for instance, PFT consensus algorithms and things like that. And maybe they're betting on these specific modules or specific features to, to term, it, term it as a blockchain. So yes, but basically, in the traditional sense, if we're talking about the blockchain, then basically it should be a chain of blocks, which is not so completely agree with you. Whereas in the traditional sense, it's not a real blockchain, but more of yeah. it. Of it different data structure. Yeah, I mean, if, if we define blockchain as something else, then it could be. And if they want to borrow some of the other features of what, a, what makes up a blockchain and leave out what I feel is probably the most important part, 
having blocks in a chain, then yeah, we could call it a blockchain. But failing that, you know, I think what they've done here is they've taken a whole bunch of different, like you said, technologies, features, uh, you know, sort of from other blockchains or other cryptocurrencies, and they've put it all together, but retained what they feel is, is a blockchain and taken out what, you know, what they don't need and still want to borrow the term blockchain to describe the, the network, which is fine. You know, they, they can do whatever they like. They can do whatever they want. But yeah, I'm still going to refer to it as a payment network of sort. But, but I, I'd like to say this is not nothing is always set in stone because come on, we have you guys know we have Bitcoin improvement proposals. We have Ethereum improvement proposals because people do stuff. And they look at it and they say, maybe we can do this or that. And then you put forth a proposal, you make one and you say, you want to do it, try this out. And then the system constantly evolves. That's, that's kind of the thing with software, right? And when you Absolutely. have the first, first version, version of Twitter, that's not going to, you have public data, you have private data, you have different versions coming out, testing, extensive debugging and all these things going on. And in the end, you deliver a something that is still never, it never really gets to where you exactly want it. You never achieve perfection. And, it's continuously uh, you, evolving. It's continuously if you, if evolving. You, right. And if you follow, if you've done like basic, maybe some math and you know that it's almost like an asymptote where you just keep getting closer and closer to this, yeah. this idea of perfection, but you, or it's like kind of like standing maybe a meter, 10 meters away from the desk, a desk. And you say, well, go halfway each time. You keep going halfway, but you never, you never actually ever, in theory, never touch the desk, which is, which is like the perfect state where everything works perfectly. You never get there. But you keep working correct. to get close to it. Yeah, correct. No, correct. And to add to that, in the, in the white paper, they term themselves as a permission network. So it's clear uh, what, what they are right now. But they also mentioned that they will be trying up to like 1,000 validators, which is quite a challenge. But the end game, I think that what they will be trying to do maybe in the future is to convert it into a permissionless net blockchain. And that's going to be a big, big challenge because a permissionless network like Ethereum or Bitcoin currently uses proof of, proof of work. And right now, and we, we do have permissionless networks which uses proof of stake or dedicated proof of stake with varying levels of decentralization. So the real challenge is really to convert the existing model to a permissionless network. Although they have that in their plans, but I believe that it will be technically very difficult um, to, to achieve that in the near future. So maybe the, it's just a question of perception that, okay, uh, right now we are permission network, but yeah. we are trying to be a permissionless network in the future. So right now, yeah. uh, bear with us and, and we'll get there. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, yeah, you know, they'll evolve and all the rest of it and iterate and pivot and all the, all the other good things until they get to this near perfect state that they have a vision for. But I think it's easier said than done, you know. It's much easier to put all these wonderful flowery things into a white paper and rainbow and unicorns, as with Ethereum. And look at Ethereum. It's been years trying to work to get to proof of stake. And it keeps moving the date because it's not an easy problem to solve you know it's much easier to just put it in there we're going to solve it eventually and we don't know how and we'll we've given a deadline of five years type of thing so yeah i mean it remains to be seen what they're going to do about that moving on though what i did find quite surprising was somewhere in there in the white paper i saw that they are going to allow a user to have as many wallets as they like as you would with a bitcoin or another network and they won't be tied to an identity for the for the wallets i just wonder how that's going to work though so, I mean, does this mean they're going to have KYC, AML? I mean, I, I just can't see that, that flying. Or am I missing something? Did, did you guys see anything in there that makes it clear how KYC and AML are going to work in terms of onboarding and, and offboarding in, into and out to of, of Libra network? I take it nobody um, saw anything with that? I don't recall that specific part, but I, I, I certainly am sure that it's going to be a very, very huge, if not unsurmountable challenge to have a payment network, whether it's a blockchain or not, that interacts with businesses in different jurisdictions and not having the KYC or AML process. So 
perhaps it's just one of those things that will have to get amended as soon as they sit down at the table with regulators in different jurisdictions and have to be some kind of form of identity for many different reasons. At the core level, I don't think, you know, there's, there's nothing sort of baked into this thing that requires sort of AML KYC. But I presume, as you say, you know, when they start talking to the regulators and that, they might maybe require it when you're on-ramping, you know, when you're buying the token or first sort of interacting with it, maybe exchanges or via Facebook itself. I mean, that's, that's another question. I wonder how they're going to launch the actual, the actual tokens themselves. Are they going to do a, a sale or, you know, how, how's it going to get into the hands of people? They're just going to sell it straight off Facebook? You put your credit card in? Or, I mean, that, that's something that remains to be seen, but something I'm eager to know, <laughs> you know. If I recall correctly, well, let's first acknowledge the fact that Facebook is not the first one to put forward all of the concepts that they put forward in, in the document. We have stable coins, which are based in the U.S., for example, Paxos is you know, back, backed by, by real assets, by liquid assets, and has all sorts of you know, licenses in, in, uh, in the United States. I believe based Telegram with their Tron project, if I recall correctly, they are aiming to build a similar tool where you can use their token within the Telegram to make payments. And if I remember correctly, the idea was there regarding the QAC and AML procedures is that you will upload your documents, your QAC documents to Telegram. They will verify you and then you will be able to use the native token to make financial decisions by goods or services. Perhaps it's something similar. But I was also thinking about this from another perspective. Just recently, like a few days, if not like a few weeks, if not days ago, when U.S. embassies all around the world have added the new rule to the application when you're applying for visa. So now not only you have to provide your ID, passport, but you also have to submit social links to your social profiles. I'm not sure, guys, if you've seen that. So I guess in, a, in many ways, in our age, the social profiles, your social profiles uh, can act as a way to validate your personality. So it might be one of the ways to look at it is just by, you know, Facebook has a lot of data on you as a person. So they might use that to kind of validate your identity and make sure that you're not breaking any laws. So if you think about it, Facebook is larger than just about every other country on earth with two billion citizens that they hold the identities to. Look, a lot of the, the, the profiles on Facebook are probably fake in that, but let's just say 99% of them will be genuinely genuine people that actually exist and have social profiles. They have just about everything on us that any other government would have where we were born. You know, they, they know our date of birth. They, they know our names. Then, In fact, they know more than what a government does. They know our habits. They know our spending habits. They know who we like, who we socialize with. They know what time we wake up generally, what content we like reading. Plus now, potentially, they're going to have actual control of the, the, the currency, just like your country, would, the one that you're living in. So, you know, if they had genuine sort of good intentions, to, as they put it, towards not banking the unbanked, but providing financial freedom to those that don't have it, you know, in third world countries and things like that. Why is it then, the question is for me, why is it that they are not supporting an existing blockchain crypt or cryptocurrency, which is for the people and not sort of centralized like their one will be, which is already out there, has a history of X amount of years, and in, in Bitcoin's case, 10 years, which already has got some level of adoption and is, is, you know, sort of the preferred sort of open, decentralized, borderless, uncensorable method of, uh, of, of storing wealth. Why haven't they just supported that? Look at Twitter, which Jack Dorsey, he has chosen to support Bitcoin. And he, he likes the idea and the concept. He's now contributing to pay for developers to help support the Bitcoin ecosystem and help support the Bitcoin core protocol. So that's where you get, you know, private enterprises that see value in something like with the Linux Foundation and things like that. And, and they contribute towards its development and sustain it, keep it sustainable. If their intentions are good, what I'm saying is, then why not just go that route? Why did they have to go to the great pain and length to go create a hodgepodge of other technologies all thrown into a pot that they can control and that they can launch? 
Do you guys, are you guys following my line of thinking there? Yes, I think that's a great juxtaposition. Twitter and Jack who's supporting Bitcoin and Facebook who's trying to create its own version of the largest, potentially the largest cryptocurrency. It's hard to say. Maybe one of the their kind of points to speculate on is that As we all know, Facebook has been a tool and was involved into hacking of uh, U.S. Uh, elections, which happened not so long ago. And so it, it started to receive a lot of criticism for exactly the same reasons that Wes, you mentioned. It's a massive centralized database of what we like, of what we dislike, of our hobbies, of you know, things that we watch and people that we connect with. And so perhaps one of the business kind of, you know, one of the ways to look at it from the business perspective related to Facebook is that it's kind of adding a new service, a new a decentralized uh, system, which potentially could kind of decrease tension and change the public perception of the company for many who got disappointed by the product, given that it has such a massive amount of data. Although your point, you know, to, to what you were saying, if, if you look beyond that, if my assertion is correct, and if you look beyond that, it just gains more power, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and to add to that, I believe that right now, Facebook, it's the biggest asset of Facebook. It's the attention that, that it has based on the number of users that are, that are on Facebook, Instagram, and, and, and WhatsApp. Um, this huge attention that they have, they want to monetize it in some form or the other. So maybe they could have launched something similar to to Amazon, like an e-commerce platform, something like that. But maybe they have chosen to set up instead an underlying infrastructure that other big companies might use in, in, in the sense of a payment system, as you mentioned. Right? So what they're trying to do is set up an infrastructure, a very big, a huge infrastructure, where every other company might use might use to conduct their own businesses. Imagine the future that Amazon is using Libra going to be to sell their items and things like that. So I believe that the way Facebook is right now in terms of attention, in terms of the user base, it's just leveraging all of this into setting up another the business for itself. So based on the on, on the attention, I believe that it at the very least it will be quite successful. Adding to what you said, are saying, we certainly know from reading the white paper that early investors and early, I believe, Libra Foundation members would be incentivized by getting, I forgot the word, capital gains, like the, the, the profits from investments. So as we mentioned earlier, a lot the, in order to create new Libra coins, one has to purchase them with fiat. That fiat is then used to purchase short-term securities, which are high, very low risk at the same time they create profit if they appreciate the value and that profit will be distributed to early investors i also would like to point one thing which is definitely and undeniably disingenuous about libra project and facebook getting into blockchain cryptocurrency uh, space is that to this day cryptocurrency projects are still banned from being advertised on facebook so i think it kind of adds to what we were talking about earlier about ulterior potential ulterior motives behind libra project and facebook uh, initiating it Yeah, true. I mean, they, they say they've unbanned it and they certainly have loosened up the rules. But, you know, I think the, the rules that they've set around advertising cryptocurrencies on their, on their network is, is, is such a tightly guarded secret on what those parameters are that it's for all intents and purposes, you're right. It, it feels as if it's still uh, banned. Yeah. And I mean, that's, <laughs> that's not exactly open, free and sort of, you know, for the best of the community as such. Well, I, I don't think so. I find it to be you know, more in the censorship camp than the open borderless sort of liberal camp, if I can put it that way. Let's have a look at the, you know, the sort of the more sort of technical side of things. From what I can tell, it's account based. So it's more sort of similar to Ethereum than Bitcoin, you know, with Bitcoin having unspent outputs, Ethereum being more sort of account based model. Is that right, Suyash? So I have not here the last part. Yeah, sorry. I was saying, From what I can tell, it seems closer to Ethereum in terms of it being account-based and not like Bitcoin, which is unspent outputs. That's just my sort of layman's glance at the at the white paper. It's got quite a few more similarities with Ethereum rather than Bitcoin in terms of the technical side of things. 
correct, absolutely correct. I mean, when I was reading the technical uh, paper, uh, it was as if I was reading about Ethereum. Like there was, uh, there, were, there, there are a lot of features which are similar in terms of uh, the way they treat transactions and, and things like that. Even the consensus algorithm, they actually use what we call a proof of authority model, something that I have studied quite a lot in the past. And this is what it is actually. And there's one similar thing that is also similar. It's uh, the events, like when you create a transaction, for each transaction, you have the option of generating events. And this is something that is present in the Ethereum event model system. So yes, it does have a lot of similarities in terms of, with Ethereum, in terms of how it stores transaction so the state of the whole of, of the whole structure of the whole blockchain and the way transactions are managed i think I, I essentially believe that a lot a lot of of features a lot of the way it works has been taken directly from ethereum which is which does make sense because ethereum has proved to be something a blockchain a very stable blockchain in terms of smart contracts and, and transactions and so on and if they could solve the scalability issue which they did by by using a preferred fourteen model then it doesn't make a lot of sense to create something completely different from scratch i mean if they could create something quite different from the existing options so for it does make sense that they use ethereum as the base to then improve on that. When I say improve, it's more of a compromise between scalability and decentralization. And I see they've come up with their own language called Move. Correct, Move. Move, it's, from what I saw, it's very uh, JavaScript-like language. Um, again, it's the same principle as, as, as Ethereum, which has solidity, and, and just the same principle, which converts the move programming constructs into, into its bytecode, which is then executed on the Libra virtual machine. So again, same principle as Ethereum. And I think that the main difference, in, in programmatically at least, is that it uses a different programming language. But I also believe that maybe to make it more accessible or easily adopted, they will be adding more features like ready to use and easy to use features in the move programming language, just to make the programming experience maybe a bit better than what is actually available in Ethereum. I have a question to you, Suyash, related to uh, what you were just d- discussing. So I know that, you know, for our listeners, there are many different programming languages out there and they have differences. Sometimes there are slight differences between languages and sometimes there are drastic differences between languages. Now, Ethereum and Libra Project took another way and instead of using existing languages that have support and community behind them, they have reimagined, if you like, JavaScript, which is a very popular language, but nevertheless, they created uh, or were creating a new language, new programming language. Do you think that abstracts, in a way, the development and ability of the community to build dApps on the blockchain, having a new language, even though it's a JavaScript-based uh, language, or is it more of a feature and adds value to the blockchain because now that tool, that language can solve specific tasks that it's meant to do for that specific blockchain? For a I don't believe that there will be, the feature that will be available in Move is not already available in, in other programming languages like Solidity. Maybe it's a bit more difficult to implement, but the fact that they are Turing, the is Turing complete and Move will probably be the same, makes them both equally adaptable in such situations. I think that the decision behind setting up move, it's more probably about control, the way smart contracts will be developed. And again, I think that Facebook is leveraging its user base, not only in terms of Facebook users, but in terms of developers who work on the Facebook ecosystem to push forward its own like agenda in terms, in terms not only a in terms of user base, but in terms of the development. Because remember, Facebook has become so popular, not only because of its platform, but also because of its openness to developers, to to, to encourage them to come and develop on their platforms, to launch their own products like games on the Facebook platform and things like that. 
And this is a model that has worked very well in the past for them. So when they're la- launching something different on a blockchain, it does make perfect sense to do the same same thing. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, they've got their own language. I also look at it from the perspective of they want more control again, you know. So, you know, as you say, you know, they're abstracting away I, I i think that you know if if you look at why why didn't they just go straight for, for ethereum for example since it's so similar it's because they wouldn't have enough control over its future development and and i think that is a big i think that's a big part of their decision to actually launch their own network as such does libra coin offer any of the features of censorship resistance i would argue absolutely not look at what came out today uh I think it's the U.S. House of Representatives. Let me have a look. Yeah, the U.S. House of Representatives Financial Services Committee has asked Facebook to stop developing the new cryptocurrency network until they can have a hearing, you know, to discuss it. I mean, that, I mean, you couldn't ask for a better example of how this thing is centralized and is not censorship resistance. This literally came out a few hours before we started recording this podcast and only came to my attention just before. So, I mean, you know, you can just imagine, and we discussed this before the podcast, you can just imagine now if if the US wanted to stop Bitcoin or didn't agree or wasn't ready for the features and and the, the, the type of freedom it was going to offer humanity and so they, they who would they call you know hey guys can you guys just put that idea on pause or that improvement proposal that you're about to release whether it's snore signatures or tap root or something whilst we uh, have a discussion about it and see if we approve of it or not you know that just can't happen and that's one of the main features not a bug a feature of, of bitcoin and and some of the other open blockchains and there we go Literally a day or almost on the same day <laughs> as, as the white paper is released, there you have something like that. The US, you know, wanting to have their uh, two cents on, on w- whether this thing should go ahead or on, on what sort of shape it should take and whether they approve of it or not. I see in other news that France, I don't know if it's their prime minister or, or their finance minister has come out saying that it's unacceptable for a company to be allowed to release their own sovereign currency and they're jumping up and down and they will not approve of it. You can imagine that there's going to be many other countries that are going to look at this and, and also get worried because it's going to usurp their ability to, to control finances within their territory. If you look at a country like South Africa, which has got extreme forex sort of exchange controls where you, there's certain allowances of how much money you can take out the country, everything is tightly controlled. You know, even with your bank account, if you want to transfer X amount of money overseas, it has to go through the central bank, which is called the Reserve Bank in South Africa. And it has to be approved by them. Even after you've done it on your internet banking, it gets blocked at the imaginary border and gets vetted and you have to answer questions and go through a whole rigmarole of, of sort of questioning on what this money is for and you're only allowed to use it for certain things and on top of that you're only allowed a certain allowance per year you know how is that going to affect countries ability to manage their their own financial borders as such i i can see them running into a plurentha i don't know how to pronounce the word but a whole barrage of problems that bitcoin doesn't have because it doesn't have that central point of creation of control you can't phone up Satoshi Nakamoto and say, hey, buddy, the privacy thing on Bitcoin, can we get rid of that? And also, can we just cap an allowance like nobody's allowed to have more than 10 Bitcoins and you can only transfer one Bitcoin in and out of the country per year? Not possible. And my hope here is that Facebook has actually calculated the risks associated with you know, creating, putting forward these track of technology that basically is like a private money and making this whole thing international. So I, I, I do hope that they have a conting, contingency plan on how to work with the regulators. And but just like you said, Wes said, I mean, we've seen uh, regulators in the United States and other countries in action and acting in some cases against blockchain projects. And not so long ago, if, we remember, if you guys remember, a founder of a decentralized Exchange and many that means was fined by U.S. regulators and a decentralized exchange basically means like you could not it's not have any central servers it works according to rules set up in code which are the code is located on the decentralized blockchain but he was still fined and yeah I mean you cannot I think this is a feature of Bitcoin you cannot phone Satoshi Nakamoto or call him to like a Senate hearing it's just not gonna happen. Yeah, true enough. However, however, guys, what what I do want to add to what you just said there, uh, Slava, is that 
this could be a very big challenge to the banks themselves. You know, the ease of use, the apparently borderless nature that they're going to hopefully get right will be a challenge to the incumbent banks. And I think it's, it's more exciting to think about what it might do in terms of disrupting them than, than it disrupting cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin specifically. And I think that maybe uh, Bitcoin might have an ally when it comes to regulators and regulations around the world, albeit a very big, powerful ally with a lot of sway um, going forward. I think that's that's something to also think about. Perhaps that this Facebook coin, Lib- Libra coin, will be more of a challenge to the banks than to Bitcoin. I, I think you don't really... Do you actually need banks? I mean, you probably need a few banks on your side. And the reason why is because if Libra coin works and becomes, you know, a real method for payments, and as we know, you, the only way to create new coins is by pay with fiat. You've got to keep that fiat somewhere. So maybe they can find a bank or two that can agree to host potentially a very, very large reserve of cash or fiat, uh, as well as short-term high liquid securities. The bank, that bank is going to benefit for sure. My hope, sure, my hope. Slava, before you go to the next thing, I mean, at the end of the day, what, how much of the world's fiat is printed anyway? It's all just numbers in a database. I think it's something like 2% of all nation is actually printed and kept in a vault in a bank somewhere it's not you know so I, i'm battling to to see the need for them beyond um, okay the current form of a bank i'm battling to see the, the the need for them in the future in their current form if that form took on a different sort of shape a different way of working or whatever it may be some other sort of custody solution yes then i think we will always have some form of bank but it Certainly, I don't think we're going to have the type of bank that the traditional bank that we are accustomed to uh, going forward. Mm-hmm. I see what you mean. My big guess as to how they're going to address big challenge, Facebook is going to address the big challenge of bringing Libra Coin to life. One of the ways is through partnerships. And we know that Facebook hopes to include over or around 100 members by 2020. But even right now, we have some really big names in different segments of in different businesses, different very established businesses who have joined, I believe, the foundation. Some of them include MasterCard, Leaf, Spotify, Uber, Waterphone, Anderson Horowitz, which is a very large venture capital fund, Kiva. And so the list goes on. So I guess it's got to take a village to, <laughs> to, grow, to raise a child. And so just possibly the, the collective mind of those organizations and, you know, using connections within the financial sector as well as, you know, regulators, connections of these organizations to, re- to regulators and lawmakers, possibly one of the ways that Libra can move forward. And to add to that, I think that a lot of the banks were actually half expecting that Facebook will enter the financial sector because I had previously, like a, a few weeks ago, I had a discussion with, with a friend of mine who works in the Canadian bank. And he was saying that specific bank, they were not really worried about Bitcoin, but they were more worried about Facebook. And what if they they done something in the financial sector um, in terms of the, the same activities that the bank actually engages in and that's what is actually happening they were right so i think that a lot of the banks were actually expecting facebook to to become a competitor in the future and that puts them in direct jeopardy of, of what facebook can do maybe the good thing is that these banks or the financial institutions and so on will be so busy fighting facebook that it could provide more leeway for bitcoin to to, to get more adoption so in any way you see, you see it, the net result is that Libra coin or the Libra project is probably a good thing for all other cryptocurrencies. A net positive, in other words, yes. I mean, yeah, you know, more, more good than bad. I can't imagine what the discussions would be like around the boardroom tables in many other banks around the world. But can you also imagine some of these re- money remittance companies like, like MoneyGram or Western Union? I mean, it's going to be a hard, hard sell to, to, for someone who's able to just, within WhatsApp, send money back to their family. You know, some migrant worker sending money back through WhatsApp, almost free, almost instantaneous to their family. How are you going to convince them to go to Western Union or MoneyGram or some of these other entities? I mean, it's almost like flicking a switch overnight. I think these 
unless these companies come up with some other use case, they're going to cease to exist. I certainly hope that will happen. <laughs> I, I, as, I, as, I lived, as I spent a lot of years in America uh, studying and working, I, I, I had to interact with those services quite a lot. And so it was definitely a, a big challenge of making transactions quickly because I would have to physically go to a closest MoneyGram location, Western Union location, perhaps to fill the form. I, I would have to go to KYC every time. And the percentage were, the percentages that I would have to pay for the service were atrocious. So I hope that this industry will get disrupted as soon as possible. Yeah. I mean, the fees are extremely high for what they do. I mean, they, sometimes you could be sending a transaction which is equal to the fees that you're paying. You know, which is absolute, absolutely ludicrous. So, I can, you know, from that perspective, I, I do think that in, in the medium term, when this thing does launch, it's going to be highly beneficial for those, you know, that don't have access to traditional banking facilities already. You know, they will have a much cheaper, quicker way of moving money or moving value around. Not necessarily with the same features as Bitcoin, but as long as they've got access to the network, they, they will they'll certainly benefit from it in the, in the medium term. In terms of the way the actual thing is structured, I came across an article by on Medium by Jameson Lopp. And he covers some of the sort of technical side of things. He also covers, you know, he basically goes through their white paper and sort of unpacks, you know, sort of line by line or paragraph by paragraph each of the different sections. And I, this is what, one part that I found quite interesting and I am not sure I understand it, but, you know, if I'm understanding it correctly, it is yeah, it's, it's certainly they've put some thought into it. They say that the Libra BF, uh, Bas, Byzantine fault tolerance consensus, the BFT consensus, Libra BFT is the consensus that they're talking about. It assumes that a 3F plus 1 vote is distributed a, among a set of validators that may be honest or Byzantine. Okay. So basically, they're saying that the algorithm that they're going to be using, right, can tolerate. 33% of the validators being dishonest, okay? Does, what does that mean? Firstly, this is very characteristic of a proof of authority consensus algorithm. Basically means it, that is at any point in time, one third of the validators, um, let's say there are nine validators, so up to three validators could actually go offline or push invalid transactions or, or, or do any kind of malicious activities, but this wouldn't affect the whole network, that is the, 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 the proper running or the pushing of transactions, the validation of transactions. It wouldn't affect the whole network. So they have a limit of up to 33% of the whole number of validators. But this still remains to be, to be seen like in practice because right now they haven't specified how many validators they will have initially. But if they are planning to, to add that to 100 or even 1,000 at some point, I saw that they are planning to add 1,000 validators, then it would be, it would be very interesting to actually see how it, it actually works. We can also compare it to Bitcoin when we're talking about transactions in a decentralized that is, you know, sent in a decentralized nature um, or recorded in a decentralized database. There's always a probability that the transaction is double spent or it's malicious. And I believe, so yes, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that with Bitcoin, you have to have 51% of the mining power to cause real trouble to the network. Correct, correct. And that's just kind of like one of the metrics that we can look at, whereas for Bitcoin, uh, it takes 50 plus percent of the mining power of validators to, to, to have a malicious intent that compares to 33% with this project, with Libra project. I suppose they, they can deal with a lower sort of threshold of dis dishonest actors within the validation network because they're known actors, as you said, like proof of authority. They're people that have been vetted and signed up and they've got reputation at stake. Whereas, you know, that would not be an acceptable level of corruption within the Bitcoin network, not sufficient and enough to, to disrupt the network. And Bitcoin needs to be held to sort of a higher threshold being, you know, with its permissionless nature. I would also probably would like to theorize that the validators in the Libra blockchain on the Libra blockchain have to be commercial organization. Even right now, anyone with a good enough computer can download the whole history of transactions of Bitcoin blockchain. However, if Libra project aims to achieve scalability similar to the one of MasterCard, as I mentioned earlier, it's about 25 
25,000 bits of party, which is around 25,000 transactions per second. That's a huge amount of data that has to be, that's just going to be very expensive to store. And so I, I guess I see when Facebook talks in the white paper that those validators would have to be academic institutions and different businesses that would be able to support such infrastructure and throughput. Yeah, true, true. I mean, that's the beauty of Bitcoin. Hey, I mean, you, as you said, you can go and validate the blocks yourself. You can go validate transactions. You can go and check in block X, Y, Z, what transactions were there, where they came from, where they went. You don't need to rely on third parties to validate and to provide that, that level of truth to you. And I think. Yeah, it, it will be a challenge for them going forward. But, you know, as you said, the more centralized, the more sort of permission based you are, the, the easier that will be. In summary here, just in a few words, I'm going to ask you one at a time. Will Facebook's Libra coin destroy Bitcoin? Suyash, how would you answer that? My answer would be a categorical, categorical no, because it's not the same thing for, for, for a start. And it is like the fundamental features of Bitcoin. What I'm referring to is decentralization, real decentralization and borderless payments. So, so I sincerely don't believe that it will uh, spell the end of Bitcoin. Actually, quite the contrary. It will spur more innovation and more adoption of Bitcoin. Slava, what are your thoughts? Will Facebook's Libra coin destroy Bitcoin? I agree with Suyash in a nutshell. I think it's a positive Libra. Libra project is a positive development for the ecosystem in general, and especially if they succeed by bringing crypto closer to the real world, and increase, which means increasing utility for all the blockchain projects. But just like Suyash said, I, I, I think Libra coin and Bitcoin address a similar issue from different angles. Libra coin being more centralized and a subject to scrutiny will not outpace or kill, especially kill Bitcoin. Good points. Both both very good points. And w- w- what I'm thinking is, what's stopping Google from producing their own coin? If you think about it, they must be sitting there now going, damn, <laughs> we should have done that. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, they, they copied Facebook. They launched, what's it, Google uh, Social Network? I, I can't remember what it was called. Google, Google Plus. Plus. Yeah, I mean, they've got Gmail. Yeah, loads of people use Gmail. They own a whole lot of things like YouTube and a lot of sort of social type of online platforms and that. You know, what's next? Can we expect like a a Google coin and the others to follow suit? The other fang, fang companies, what's it? Facebook, Apple, maybe Apple coin. Apple's already got Apple Pay. They must also be looking at this going, damn. (laughs) <laughs> you know, who's to say they won't all be releasing their own coins shortly? That would be a very interesting future yeah. because we're already experiencing a lot of people observe that the chronic capitalism that leads to a host of issues with how the business interacts with the society. Sometimes it's just not working well for the majority for the society. And if you add more power to all the corporations, they will become to create their own currency, I think that might just create more challenges, potentially create more challenges for the global community. Yeah. I mean, if I had to answer the same question, sorry, uh, Suyash, if I had to answer the same question, I I wholeheartedly don't think that the Facebook Libra coin will destroy uh, Bitcoin uh, at all. I mean, I think that's quite clear in in our discussion. I do think that it's going to highlight some of the strong features of of Bitcoin. And I do think that Facebook's Libra coin, if it actually comes to fruition and it isn't blocked by countries and regulations and, and, and all the rigmarole around that, I think that it will get a very high level of adoption because it's probably going to have an amazing interface, uh, user interface. I mean, Facebook has been building front-facing solutions for years now and dealing with billions of people. It has a lot of data that it can use to really fine-tune some great-looking, great-working sort of software. So, I mean, I acknowledge that. And I think that it still will be a net positive because you just can't remake another Bitcoin. As much as everybody likes to try, you know, oh, we like Bitcoin, but, you know, we can change this and do that. And, you know, this will be the next Bitcoin type of thing. And, and, and I just don't think that's, that's 
possible right now. I'm not saying it's it's never possible, but I think Bitcoin stands on its own as quite unique in, in many ways. And and that's not really replicatable. It hasn't been yet. Whether that might happen in the future, maybe, but nothing, including this Libra coin, makes me think that anything out there right now is able to replicate some of the, the best properties of the Bitcoin that network. You were going to say, uh, Suyash? Yeah, and I would add to that, I, I would be surprised if the other big companies like Google, Amazon, and Apple haven't really started working on their own native coins because it's become such an important part of um, today's economy and financial landscape that these companies need to be in, 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 in this game also. And, and to, to get back to Libra, in one part of the statistical paper, they did mention that they, they did not consider proof of work based protocols due to their poor performance and, and high energy consumption. But honestly, that's, that, that, that's not really, really the case because if they did go on a proof of work protocol, it wouldn't have worked at all. It would have been a huge, huge security risk for them. So they had only one option, that is go on a proof of authority model, and that's what they have done. And yet, yet when I read the white paper, I mean, they, they do, I mean, they, I know you're saying it's proof of authority, but they do say that they're going to go to, they're going to expand on this and make it permissionless. Does that mean it's going to become proof of stake in a sense? I I'll mean, see. proof of authority is kind of proof of, a, a form of proof of stake, if you think about it. But with it. I mean, they're staking, first of all, they say it's like $10 million to become a validator. That's how much these companies are investing or staking. And then proof of authority from the sense that obviously they're managing their reputations, but Going forward, they want to transition. They don't know how yet. They acknowledge that. But within the next five years, they want to transition to permissionless. Now, at that at that point, which then we will call it proof of stake, right? Correct. And the important thing is that most probably they have seen how Ethereum is, is evolving and the difficulty they had to transition from one proof of one consensus algorithm to another. And what they are doing is actually start with something that they can control in terms of validators setting up a fixed number of validators. Yes. And then when transitioning to something else, let's say a more open permissionless consensus algorithm, I yes. believe that it would be more of a technical difficulty than that than a governance one. So it, it would be much, much easier to transition to you. Yes, no, true. But I mean, it's the same thing when you looked at IOTA, right? They have the, a DAG and they had this special validating, I, I can't remember what you called it, a coordinating node in the beginning so that they could launch the network and so they could run it and grow it that they have control over. But the, the ultimate aim is to get rid of that and let the network, you know, run on its own, be more permissionless. So it's, it's similar in that sense. So it's sort of they're acknowledging in the beginning stages, it's easier for them to have control, but they do want to release it out there. Okay, look, uh, there's a lot more information that I'm sure is going to be coming out and there'll be a lot of people analyzing the white paper, not only from within the cryptocurrency space, but also in the financial sector. You're going to have commentary from banks, from regulators, governments, parasitals, all sorts of people are going to come out now and give their two cents on this white paper and what it could mean pros, cons. A lot of people are probably going to call for the death of Bitcoin. You know, I can already imagine Nouriel Rabini coming out and, and saying that this is the end of Bitcoin. And I'm pretty sure Peter Schiff will be doing the same. But uh, nevertheless, I still think this is net positive. It's been great. Thanks. Yeah. Until next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of Let's Talk Crypto. I really hope you've enjoyed the information that we've shared today on the new Libra coin by Facebook. If so, please leave us a like or leave a comment below. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or leave us a rating on iTunes. Hope you have a wonderful weekend and we'll catch up next week.